Welcome to the Biomin Antibiotic Reduction Expert Series. My name is Ryan Hines. I'm the Communications Manager at Biomin. And today we're going to talk about swine disease prevention and the role of organic acids. Joining me are two experts. We have Natalia Roth of Biomin. Hello, Natalia. Hello. And we're also joined by Diego Padwan, a swine consultant out of Italy. Hi, Diego. Good morning, everybody. Great to have you both aboard. Now we've got uh, people joining from throughout the world. We're very excited to have this live discussion for those of you who are able to participate right now. I just wanted to point out two things before we begin. Uh, first of all, this is an interactive session. So at any point during today's session, you can go ahead and use the chat function enabled in your platform in order to write a question for either of our experts. We'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can. We're gonna do that uh, during the presentation, we also have a dedicated question and answer session towards the end of our hour. The second thing we're able to do, because this is interactive, is that we can also ask you a couple of audience poll questions and get your opinion on some of these topics that we're discussing today. And we'll do that several times throughout the session. All right. So let's go ahead and get started with some introductions. Natalia, you're going to be our first speaker today. Why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do at Biomed? Sure, it's a pleasure. Um, so my role in Biomin, uh, I'm a global product line manager asset. And with that, I have responsibility and expertise and uh, research and development of asset-based products, production, um, application on the field, sales and distribution. In terms of uh, application, um, I also provide my expertise on antibiotic use and antibiotic resistance in animals. And of course, um, a focus on how to replace antibiotics with organic acid. Absolutely. And we're very glad to have you and to bringing that particular expertise to this session. This is the 14th edition of our antibiotic reduction expert series. Uh, we also have uh, a swine expert, a resident uh, veterinarian, Diego Padwan, joining us from Italy. Diego, why don't you introduce yourself for everyone? Good morning, everybody. I'm, uh, as Ryan say, I'm a pig vet, a life in uh, pig uh, health and management. Now recently retired, but continue to work as consultant with uh, Biomin. And uh, ready to share my experience, because it's the only thing I can do, share my experience with uh, all of you today. Thank you. All right, that's wonderful. Um, thank you both. Uh, again, for our, our live audience today, if you have any questions, go ahead and let us know uh, in the chat function. We are going to start with some prepared remarks. Of, and Natalia, you're going to start us off. So please go ahead. Yes, um, it's a pleasure for me to talk to you uh, today about the role of organic acid in the swine disease prevention. So, talking about the swine disease prevention, uh, we know which diseases are important, more important, and less important. And as a person who has spent uh, many years in uh, research and development, I was trying to catch something um, up to date uh, and present um, a global trend in disease of swine. Fortunately, there was a nice review of uh, 27,000 publications that were conducted in the last 50 years that shows which are the relevant pathogens that cause disease. So in general, we can see here that um, Salmonella and E. coli have a, most, a lot of attention. It means uh, there were 6,000 or almost 6,500 publications on Salmonella and around 5,000 on E. coli. So which shows these are um, the pathogens that are interested, uh, interesting for the scientific audience uh, and uh, for the international work of scientific audience, which you can see on the right corner, um, the countries where the publications come from and also their network. It means if there were a connection between countries, there were some common publications between them. Um, just going a little bit deeper into this topic and splitting the pathogens by regions, uh, we can recognize that. Uh, 
globally, there, there are some uh, pathogens of interest and pathogens that cause us problems uh, in common. All of the regions have uh, influenza, salmonella, peers, uh, E. coli, PCB2, and FMD. And talking again about E. coli and salmonella, we can also see that these are the pathogens uh, that are causing problems in the majority of the regions. But here I would also like uh, to um, show you and to ask also the uh, expertise of uh, people that are on the field. And here I have my colleague Diego, fortunately. Uh, Diego, can you please comment here? What is your experience? You are the guy who is every day on the field, traveling a lot around the world and knows swine diseases. What do you think? Um, and what yes, is your the report you show is uh, pretty correct uh, for two uh, type of reason. E. coli is present in the gut and always ready to set wild when there are stressors uh, in the animals, while Salmonella is present in always, always in the pig, but is not. Uh, in a high amount like E. coli, but the reason why Salmonella is a big concern because it's transmissible to human and can create a huge problem. So the two main gut problems all around the world, and I'm traveling part of it and seeing that E. coli and Salmonella are really the main problems in uh, pigs, and not only pigs, also all other animals. But today we are talking about pigs. All right, now based on that input, um, thank you, Natalia. You brought us in from the academic research perspective. Diego, you shared your experience on the field, uh, but we also have uh, professionals in the swine industry from across the globe participating right here and right now. So let's go ahead and get their input on what they see as major gut problems. And we're going to do that with our first audience poll. So if you would go ahead and choose one or several of the answers that best suit your situation and your experience that you uh, see in professional life is what is the main gut problem on the swine farms based on where you're at and what you're seeing. Uh, it, the options available are Salmonella, E. coli, Brachyspira, Sonia, and other. As we see that many, oh, everyone is very quick uh, today to jump in and participate there. So we already have two thirds of our audience having voted. Uh, that's probably the quickest poll we've ever had. So I'm going to go ahead and close those this poll. Thank you for everyone who participated. Let's go ahead and have a look at those results. Uh, so this uh, is fairly in line with what we had um, just discussed, but we see that for Salmonella, we have 28%. E. coli is 84%. Brachyspira is 33% and other is 13%. And when you see that those numbers exceed 100%, it's because the multiple answers could be chosen by each participant. Thank you all for that input. And Natalia, we can go right back to you and you can take us through uh, to some of the implications or what to do about all of this. Uh, yes. So what can we do and what is actually the main uh, substance, what is used to prevent diseases that uh, cause our problems? Uh, the next uh, publication that was published in 2019, I will cite it, uh, so that the use of antibiotics for infection prevention is globally still common in the production. Let's check if the data really confirm this. What is the use of antibiotics in large swine producing countries? The data, the last report published in 2020 by FDA shows that antibiotic use in swine from 2016 to 2019 have declined, which is a, a very good achievement. And other regions, which is also a large swine producing region, which is Europe, there was another report, and uh, the latest report from uh, um, European um, made, um, agency shows that here there is a big variation um, in antibiotic use if we talk about the country. Let's have a closer look on large swine producing countries. 
uh, we can see the numbers of antibiotic use expressed in milligrams per population conversion uh, unit, which means milligram of antibiotic that is used to produce the same amount of mucoviture. We can see the data from 2010 to 2018. And fortunately, the large um, swine producing countries like swine, like uh, Germany and France, as well as Spain, we could see a huge drop of antibiotic use. And we need to keep in mind that majority of antibiotics is still used in swine production. Actually, in, do in, in those countries, the use of antibiotics uh, within the period of time was reduced by the half, which is also a very great achievement, and uh, a way to go, to continue to go. And there is still a need to continue to reduce antibiotic use. Why? That can be uh, shown in the next slide about the uh, situation on antibiotic resistance. So what do we see here? Um, we can see again the number of countries and the percentage of multi-resistant um, E. coli in this case, because E. coli is used very often as indicative bacteria to express resistance in gram-negative uh, bacterial population. The light green color shows us the E. coli percentage that are susceptible. It means all the E. coli that were analyzed, for example, in Norway, and more than 80%, around 83% were susceptible. It means not resistant to any antibiotics, and other uh, resistant or multi-resistant. And we can see that there is a, a, a large number of countries where uh, we still see the high percentage of uh, antibiotic resistance and multi-resistant bacteria. This is the reason why we need to put and to continue to put our effort uh, into reduction of antibiotics. Uh, we had started down the path of the, the main challenges in gut pathogens that we see in swine operations uh, and how this often can require antibiotic or antimicrobial intervention. And there are, of course, down, clear downsides to that. Uh, so we want to have alternatives available. Okay, Ryan. Right. Can, you can you all see the screen? Yes. Now we have your slides up and we're looking at factors influencing and grab microbiota. And yeah. microbiota so please so go ahead and pick the first one the, the, the theoretical uh, and scientific introduction of natalia will come afterwards because uh, he is uh, he is introducing the concept of a microbiome he is uh, the bacterial population of the gut that has a paramount important for the physiology anatomy and functionality of uh, all the body but this microbiome has a weak point. And so through different uh, factors, like uh, host factor, management environment, diet, and additives, this, uh, this uh, microbiome, this bacteria population can be modified positively or negatively. And when there is a, a perturbation in the microbiome, we have a problem like diarrhea, and many others. The concept I want to introduce, or that uh, the people who knows me, I'm uh, putting I'm putting a lot of stress on, is the concept of condition diseases. All, almost all diseases, influenza first, PCD2, E. coli, Lozonia, Salmonella, Brachyspira, are so-called condition diseases. That means uh, that without the stress factors, the bugs are present in the body or may be present in the body and don't create any problem. When there is a, a problem in uh, in the balance of the body, in the in the health of the body, so a stressor factor that could be psychological, environmental, or immunological, then we have perturbation of the microbiome with a problem in the gut that means diarrhea and even more the microbiome is uh, is created or is established at birth because the piglets uh, uh, are born without 
any bacteria, they are, have a sterile uh, gut. They immediately have, have birth already in the birth channel. They, they have the introduction of bacteria through the mouth, uh, and these uh, bacteria are colonizing in a proper sequence, because we know that first is starting in Clostridium, then Streptococcus, then after one day, uh, Lactobacillus is uh, taking the main part uh, in the gut. If uh, this sequence is perturbated at birth, then we have serious diarrhea from Clostridia, for, for example. So perturbation can come from, again from stress, antibiotic use, because we remember that the use of antibiotic is not only killing the, ta the targeted uh, bugs, but it's also killing a lot of useful bugs. So the use of antibiotics must be only for treatment and in particular situation. Otherwise, it's better to pay great attention instead of using. Clearly, in practice, it seems that works very well, and it works to solve uh, maybe the acute phase of the disease, but uh, the outcome is not always positive. And clearly also dietary changes when they are suddenly administered can create a perturbation in the microbiome. To remember also, not only stress factors, there are up to 11 viruses able to create a diarrhea. So not only coronavirus and rotavirus that are well known, but many other like PCV2 are able to create diarrhea, so perturbation in the environment and in the microbiome. The microbiome is very useful for the uh, physiology of the, of, the, of the body, but not only in the gut, also in the skin, wherever. But uh, uh, in, this, in, uh, in the gut is important in the little gut for digestion and fermentation. Here can compete with the body to absorb some nutrients, but it's also providing uh, nutrients like uh, uh, enterobacteriaceae uh, bacteriaceae are able to synthesize vitamin K that this body cannot. So they provide also nutrients to the body. In the second part, in the hind gut, in the large intestine, they uh, create a fermentation uh, uh, situation. They ferment and many fiber. And this way, through short chain fatty acid, they provide the, the basis to produce energy in the body. So the body, the, the body is absorbing acetate, propionate, butyrate that enter the energy cycle to produce to produce any kind of energy. In the cell, for example, up to 20% of energy intake and need can come from the hindgut. So the hindgut is a big fermenter. It is important to understand in the, in the nutrition. If uh, the uh, balance of the microbiome is perturbated, we know that along the gastrointestinal tract, here you represent different ones, you have different kind of uh, affliction of uh, infection. But you see that mainly stomach, uh, uh, little gut, uh, thin gut, you have E. coli and salmonella that are the most important. As I repeat, E. coli because it's always there. And this uh, also from the answers of the third question, we see that E. coli is the main concern. Maybe in the year 3000 will be still a concern because E. coli is needed, is present. According to what uh, uh, Natalia will show you, enterobacteriaceae are only 2-3% of the all bacterium, but they are ready in stress or uh, in, uh, in particular situations to set wide and create a huge problem, mainly at weaning in the piglet, and this is a known uh, syndrome. So according to the tract of the GIT, we can have different uh, syndrome. We know on the other side that, that uh, organic acid application uh, they are uh, known since uh, hundreds of years, but they are working since millions of years because acidification is working against uh, mainly 
gram-negative uh, bacteria, and there is no resistance because if a, a bacteria becomes resistant to resistant to acidity, is another becomes another bar. So there is no resistance. So this is a well working and wonderful tool to prevent and create the right environment to prevent uh, GIT for problem. But we know organic acid can improve performance, improve the feed and water hygiene, and improve GIT health. For this, uh, you know, this uh, top line uh, in, uh, in Biomin, there is not only a, a, a mix of organic acid that were chosen according to their potential to inhibit the growth of uh, main uh, gut pathogens, but there is also uh, with uh, that I okay now I can show you cinnamaldehyde that is very good uh, in uh, in uh, decreasing or stopping bacterial growth uh, and disturbing the communication among uh, bacteria because they communicate uh, among them to know how many they are and look to know when they is the moment to to set wild and together the main technological core of the top line is the permeabilizing complex that is able to permeabilize the bacterial wall of gram negatives mainly and uh, allow uh, uh, organic acid to penetrate the, the bacteria and inhibit the physiological process or even to kill with this uh, complex we are really able with little amount to create good uh, result and positive uh, result uh, in the in the farm today i talk about uh, to you about uh, three experiences uh, we did uh, in italy i'm working uh, europe russia europe and africa mainly but i'm based on uh, in uh, in italy and here i was able to to do three main trials the first uh, the the first one on the left uh, in Pegognave, it was a site too of an antibiotic free uh, farmer where they had the Brachiosparin salmonella with uh, many uh, deaths and only uh, uh, implying to three and biosecurity. You see, it's very it's isolated, it's wonderful, completely isolated uh, from, from uh, other, other situations or other farms. Uh, with the only application of uh, uh, TOF3, we were able to solve the problem of Brachyspira and Salmonella. In the central one, this is another farm, this is a win to finish. Here, there was a huge problem of Salmonella in, uh, in the winning, uh, in the winning area, but because of a lack almost lack of biosecurity and bad management, we were not able to solve the situation. And also the management was very poor. The, the workers were commuting from winning to finishing any moment, it was not able. This was jeopardizing. I will stress also at the end, uh, uh, pinpoint uh, at the end of, the, of this presentation that uh, antibiotic, acids whatever you, you we use it to show the problem is not uh, working if we not uh, improve management and imply good biosecurity because if you continue to inject bacteria in the in the barn in the system whatever you, we use uh, the solution cannot be successful on the right side is the uh, site two winning unit, a big winning unit of uh, 2,000 uh, South Pharma that was positive with PERS and whatever, and they had a big problem with Salmonella, implying biosecurity. I will show you this in the in the next slide. Biosecurity and improving management, we were able to show very good effect of uh, the top three in the in uh, with the problem. So I go to this uh, uh, experience. It was uh, it could uh, it could uh, give a, a peer review paper because we had a very good uh, result. 
the condition was, uh, as I said, the site two uh, in uh, over 2,000 South Farm. We created uh, three groups of 450, nearly 450 uh, uh, piglets at weaning. In the first group, uh, we we gave uh, one kilo to three. In the second group, we gave one milliliter per liter of uh, top liquid, that is the liquid version of top three. And the third group was a control group. The rule was to introduce the piglet, keep them well isolated, uh, put in the in the pens and don't touch them anymore if not absolutely needed. If entering the pens, the farmer ought to uh, disinfect again the boots after entering one pen or the other. We were collecting weight, feces, and serums, to, and we tried to detect E. coli and salmonella. Unfortunately, E. coli at the winning is a, a storm of different serotypes, and we were not able to trace. But we were able to trace the salmonella shedding means the salmonella that is released with the feces from, from the animals. And we could see that with the top three and top liquid, there was a almost completely successful result in stopping the shedding. If you stop the shedding, it means there is not any more replication. And little by little, the salmonella is almost disappearing, completely hard to, hard to say. Why in the control group, this didn't happen? Also, by a power point of view of microbiology, you can see that the group of top three and top liquid, white and gray, the number of, of, of salmonella were decreasing, while the control group not the same, and the part of top three and top liquid was significantly lower. But the point is also that whenever you apply the product, even if the farmer is doubtful about uh, the result that they will come. When you apply, you have always, always a better increase. You see exit weight, uh, top three, top liquid uh, control, top three, the, the feed intake, the feed conversion, and the final weight is always better. And so if the final weight is higher, the cost of, uh, of uh, the, the, the product is paid off. And then most of the times, if biosecurity and better management are implied, you solve also the pathology. But anyway, the resulting performance is always, we, is always present. Another experience we are having now in this uh, year, last year, now 2020, started uh, already in 2019 but from December you know that in Denmark the farms are uh, evaluated to be allowed to send the animals to the abattoir they are uh, uh, evaluated according to a, a, a salmonella index there is a calculation you can find in internet <clears throat> according to the sample they take uh, they find a certain number of uh, salmonella and they get uh, uh, an index. The target is to stay below 2.5. And you can see that uh, implying administering uh, top three starting from February of uh, 2020, little by little or little by little, fairly quickly, the index was going to the target and is going down. Last month it was a little bit up because I, I couldn't. I, I got just the result yesterday. But uh, this is the behavior of salmonella in waves. You have moment that is getting up and down, so it will continue like this. But uh, hopefully, never or just once a year above the target level. But this is a huge result because this is a 6,000 South Farm with a winning and a finishing. And so it's not easy to get this result 
in such a, a big farm. Clearly, management in yes. Denmark. Sorry? If, if I may. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. We, we see a dramatic result here. Uh, could you speak to the fluctuations we see, particularly from May onwards? So there's been a lot of, if you're familiar with this uh, operation in particular, the numbers came down quite dramatically with the application of Biotronic Top 3. But then we see from month to month, there was still some variation going on. Uh, any idea uh, what factors may have influenced that? No, it didn't make me understand. I say this waving, this up and down, is a characteristic of salmonella. Because you have a period, uh, clearly this, uh, you don't know when it's happening in the animal, but in general, it is describing the, the, the um, behavior of salmonella. Salmonella here was huge. When it's huge, it's going down. Then you have a period of disappearance because uh, most probably or almost surely the salmonella is uh, inside the mucosa cells because it is an intracellular parasite. And so it's the, almost disappearing from the feces. Then uh, it's killing some cells, uh, is uh, released uh, inside the gut wall, is inside the gut lumen, and you find again. Then it's disappearing, and when is it in the gut, uh, in the gut lumen, top three is killing or creating non-suitable uh, condition to, to, to live or to create a pathogenicity. Then it's disappearing again because it's uh, staying in the, in, the, in the cell, then coming out, uh, they may be, uh, and this uh, wave uh, is a uh, very characteristic uh, of uh, salmonella. That, that is the, the point. Clearly, this is by chance. You go there once a month and take some samples from different animals to trace properly, uh, but you ought to have a uh, labeled animal. Uh, ear tag and follow. This way is just to collect a number that is statistically valuable, number of samples, and give an index. To give an idea, but anyway, also the idea since are big numbers, you see this uh, waving is a characteristic of uh, salmonella. All right, yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Okay, so about the salmonella, we know is working, maybe not disappearing, hardly to disappear, even not uh, antibiotics are able to. To, to kill completely salmonella. There was a professor saying if uh, in a necropsy or in a pig you don't find salmonella, it means you didn't properly look for. Salmonella depends also from the serotype, but uh, not even antibiotics are able to kill because as we're saying is an intracellular parasite. When intracellular, you cannot uh, kill the, the salmonella. So the antibiotic or top three is in the lumen, killing or uh, stopping any pathogenicity and bringing the salmonella out. <clears throat> when the, the antibiotic of three is gone, some salmonella come out again from uh, the cells and restart a little by little the pathogenicity. That's why an, uh, acids are strategic for salmonella, antibiotic are not. Because antibiotic, you can use, you can imply only a few days, while acidifiers you can use for months, years without any problem, in the proper, in the proper way and with the proper uh, composition. Otherwise, you can have also problem. But it's not the, the matter of today. So uh, about after Salmonella, our let's say next step was to prove. Uh, also, the efficacy of TO3 for Lozonia, that is created, is all, again, an intracellular parasite, parasite, mainly of the ileum. In fact, it's creating so-called ileitis. And this creating according to if uh, coming is uh, as acute or chronic uh, uh, affliction for sign intestinal and adenopathy, necrotic enteritis, regional ileitis, proliferative hemorrhagic enteropathy. There are four different uh, syndromes created by the same. I remember central target is the uh, main target is ileum. And brachyspira, that is also a parasite of the hindgut, 
but is not uh, intracellular, it's mostly extracellular, creating a colitis. But his peculiarity is uh, hiding be behind the necrotic tissue that uh, is creating. So it's a sort of uh, encapsulation or protection from, uh, from uh, uh, antibiotics. Also here, the antibiotic is not strategic when strategic are acidifiers or organic acids. About ozonia, the only evidence we were able to, to draw to, to, to get a trial at Minnesota University, the use of uh, top three peaks in this case, but top three is uh, that the lesion score of the of the Ilium in Jejunu was by far less, significantly less than the control that is already, because this uh, lesion score comes from a chronic uh, infection of Lozonia. This means uh, that when Lozonia is uh, out of the cells in the lumen, the biotronic, uh, the effect of biotronic is able to uh, kill them or not allow them to enter again in the cells and bring them out in the with the feces and is a huge huge result but is a, up to date the only evidence we were able to to draw because others bacteriological we were not able to see any evidence but this is already a good result for brachyspira we did the trial i showed you from the picture in Italy, it was a far to finish system in northern Italy. Standard or <laughs> let's say standard, bad, bad uh, health status, PERS, PCV2, Magoste, everything. They had everything. The Brachyspira was fought uh, through antibiotic with the so called pulsing system, is the classical. Since I was saying the Brachyspira is hiding behind or under necrotic tissue that is creating itself to provide three, four, five consequent days of antibiotic is not working because after one day the lumen is already clean but the spiral is hidden. So the classical way is to provide according to how often is coming out the diarrhea or sign of brachyspira to provide one day of antibiotic and then wait three, five, seven. In this case, every week was one day of, of antibiotic. The condition of the trial in this system was two group sources from the same pharma. In the adwining, already we provided uh, 1.5 kilo of top three because we have to keep uh, a healthy, uh, healthy gut and already start uh, to, to, to act uh, against uh, Brachyspira because Brachyspira usually is, uh, the signs are appearing in the finishing units, but clearly Brachyspira is sourced from the south, so is already present at winning also if we don't see any sign. And so we were using uh, TOT3 in this period, also not only Brachyspira, but also E. coli, that is anyway working very well. At finishing, we created two groups uh, of uh, 620 pigs, uh, completely separated uh, in uh, two rooms, uh, and uh, administering one kilo per ton of TOT3. You, you understand one kilo per ton is uh, nothing. Two trays at the back, as I will say, we created 30 sentinels per group that were here targeted to trace the pathogen. It's the only way to properly trace, to, to be able to trace a pathogen. And uh, annual samples were also were taken at time zero, entering and finish unit, time one, 84 days, time two, 111, and time three, 176 days. Here are the results. The investigation of the 30 plus 30, then we somewhere missing because they lost uh, the ear tag. The brachyspira isolation in the control world, zero brachyspira at time zero entering, three at time one, four time two, and four at time three. You see, the situation is growing, even if they were administered every week 
uh, one, one day of, uh, of antibiotic, while the thesis had the zero at 20, at, uh, on 20, zero at time zero, zero at time one, one at time two, and zero again at time three. You see, some are decreasing because the attacks were lost. So at the end, I go back at the end. This is the, the, the graph. At the end, the biotronic only one against 11 samples were positive with brachyspira. And this is a, a huge, a huge result. For the antibiotic uh, treatment, clearly the control got 16 times a pulse administration, one every one day every week. When they saw the first sign, more or less here, the first sign of brachyspira, the owner decided to go on with the same system. So half of the finishing process they started, and the the control, the control, the thesis group got eight times pulse administration. So we have much later appearance of uh, of signs and less uh, less admin, uh, antibiotic administration. And now I show you what is uh, at the end the result. First of all, as happened with uh, with the Salmonella, the top three group uh, at the end of finishing phase was uh, six kilo per head heavier than the control peaks, so 47 grams <laughs> better growth or higher growth per day. And this is already you understand the best result what the farmer wants. But on the other side lower antibiotic administration eight against 18 days of lincomycin and give reason of more or less zero four euro per head of lower cost so at the end with a cost of 1.98 euros per head of top three we had a return on investment of one to four point six so i repeat even if they don't see, they don't detect uh, the, the improvement of the pathology that you usually see. For sure, you have improvement of, of uh, performances. That is, at the end, what makes uh, pay off the product and makes happy the farmer. So, to conclude, what are the top three or top line uh, uh, application uh, according to production phase? Hygiene is at every stage and is very important. Hygiene of the feed, hygiene of the pipes, not only uh, formic acid mainly is cleaning, not only the pipes uh, of, of uh, the, the distribution line in the farm, but is also used on purpose by uh, feed factories to clean the production system because formic acid is cleaning more or less everything. So by hygiene is applying everywhere. For digestibility, we focus in weaning and growing pigment because we know that improving in the right way, not just like this, improving the right way, the acidity of the stomach, we improve protein digestibility. And so weaning and growing piglets by this point of view, are a little bit weaker and we can really help. But then in specific trouble, that can be lactating sows, that can be, but this is more by a point of view of calcium physiology and farrowing process meat production, but also in providing the healthy environment in the farrowing cage, because the feces of the of the mother are creating an environment, bacteriological environment in the farrowing cage, and it's a starting <coughs> the bacterium of the piglet. So having a more healthy uh, gut is creating a healthier gut in the piglet. But then in uh, weaning, we know for weaning diarrhea and edema, in growing and finisher. Diarrhea is always behind the corner. And in specific cases, when there is, a, as I was uh, showing, there is a specific uh, infection, let's say salmonella, today in many European countries, but not only 
the abattoir they check for salmonella if they find that they stop the farm or they don't purchase anymore in case of salmonella prevalence in the farm by applying we have a good experience by applying the last two months one kilo to three per ton we can you see you have seen uh, from the experience that in two months more or less is uh, dropping so in two in two months more or less we are able to drop uh, the prevalence of salmonella so as uh, at the abattoir at the slaughterhouse they don't have any more problem last slide uh, to conclude uh, there are some points uh, to some uh constant to pinpoints about the biotronic uh, uh use acidifier without biosecurity uh, hardly show any effect i was already saying also antibiotics no way if we don't imply biosecurity if we don't improve management we cannot expect that uh, that uh, uh, a product is improving the situation okay the application the sauburn free acid in the stomach to produce energy if we use a free acid <laughs> and not uh, absorbed and protected as in top three all acids are used inside the stomach to produce energy and so we expect uh, results uh, in the in the in the intestine and this not come simply because organic acid don't go don't are not able to 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 go through the stomachs where they are completely used to, for energy at weaning the protein level at weaning depending from a feed intake usually farmers think absolutely the opposite the less they eat the more higher the protein level must be it's not absolutely true they eat if they are able to process. So the more they eat, the higher can be, and goes from 22 down to 16% of protein. And why farmers try to give a high protein level? Because they think that high protein means high performance, high growth is not absolutely true. You find in this table on the right, there are different uh, uh, author that show, could show in the trial that the average daily feed intake and uh, daily gain and feed conversion absolutely is not depending that from the crude protein but from the lysing level okay if we keep a correct lysing level the protein the protein level is not the main driver of performances and we can stay low at 17 16 15.5 having anyway good results and the lower and when the crude protein is lower we have less uh, problem with uh, uh, gut putrefaction on which uh, e coli is growing quite happily and so this is important very important to know last point as is are not antibiotic we can use in prevention and prevention in the way when we have a syndrome when we have uh, the, the disease we are obliged to use antibiotics but the damage is already happened and we have a further cost of antibiotics so the master way to gut health is prevention with the support of organic acids and this is working well since centuries so we have to continue work on that direction with this uh, i thank you and uh, and uh, give uh, the stage to natalia and waiting for your questions thank you well, thank you diego that will bring us uh, right into our q a session uh natalia very glad to see that you're back uh, we've we've received many questions uh diego and natalia i'll ask you uh, for the sake of time, let's focus on short key message answers to start the discussion, um, and then any follow-up or detailed information can be done uh, subsequently offline or with uh, Biomin representatives. So let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, thank you for everyone who has submitted a question so far. Uh, Diego, let's start with the, the role of organic acids, because you just concluded your final point 
Um, acids are not antibiotics. It's about prevention. But um, you know, vaccination is also a method of prevention. Are antibiotics, are, are acids meant, or could they be considered as a replacement for vaccination strategies? Look, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, I say organic acids are not antibiotic, but they are because they can kill. But they are not as, uh, and they are selective against gram negative, so they have a huge uh, advantage on antibiotics. Vaccination is, a, <coughs> to me, a last resource. If you are not able with management and organic acid to improve the situation, maybe, or you have a very terrible bug in the farm, you can uh, use a vaccination. But vaccination is uh, creating stress. And when you inject, you are injecting other things. So maybe from a problem with E. coli, you get into a problem with streptococcus. So you have to find uh, you tailor. You have to find the tailor-made solution for your farm with uh, your vet or with uh, our support, because we are traveling around just troubleshooting this kind of problem. But there are four options. The best one is uh, biosecurity management, organic acids. Yeah, Thanks. and and let me take that to the next challenge. Um, uh, because I think those elements that you've pinpointed there are crucial. Uh, would you have a different answer if the question is, what is the best treatment for diarrhea? Or does it still come back to those? <laughs> the, be the best is a cork. <laughs> the only way, there is no best treatment. There is, a, there is I would say, 11, 11 viruses able, able, to create the diarrhea. That can be the starting point, management, whatever. So according to the situation, the farm situation, the farmer mindset, we have also to adapt our work to the farmer, what the farmer is able or understand what to do. So there is not the best, but not surely antibiotic. Antibiotic is to run after the problems and you are always higher cost, more problem. So prevention. The best treatment against diarrhea is prevention. All right, so prevention is best medicine. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned viruses, uh, so let's uh, use that as a jumping off point to talk about a virus uh, that is infamous in the swine industry, uh, African swine fever virus, right? Uh, is there any evidence, uh, Diego or Natalia, that you're aware of about the efficacy of uh, organic acids against ASF? Uh, yes, there are publications. There are publications showing that uh, uh, the, in the in the in the feed uh, in the, the there can be. Can you hear me? We do. Yeah, because the changing, I lost some part. Anyway, uh, uh, there are publications also recently showing that uh, the acidification is. Uh, creating an uh, adverse environment for the virus. So if not killing completely, is uh, keeping very low, is uh, sanitizing the, the feed from uh, the virus, not the meat, eh? but the meat, uh, you know. <laughs> One who eats uh, the meat from after time, swine fever, pig is, <laughs> I don't know, must be very hungry. Eh? <laughs> Natalia, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, uh, I, I, African swine fever is a very big challenge. This is very clear for us, and uh, I would not uh, you know, dare to say, okay, use organic acids, and there will be no problem with African swine fever. If it would be that easy, it would be great, but unfortunately, it's not the case. So, uh, African swine fever is a disease that is very serious, and if there is an occurrence of African swine fever in the farm, uh, then there is an obligation to um, reduce the animal or to eliminate the animal counts and uh, whereas this can support is the, the, the part of biosecurity so biosecurity and management is the key to prevent uh, the african swine fever and to keep it out of the farm and uh, acid is a part of the biosecurity that it should be present in the feed but uh, i think this comprehensive approach and understanding of the disease is very important absolutely um, and let's stay with you, Natalia. Uh, we have a question here about the physiological gut importance of organic versus medium chain uh, fatty acids. 
Uh, so short versus medium chain. Uh, do we see a difference? Do we need both from a practic practitioner perspective? Are you going to select one or versus another? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, there is. Uh, we have uh, a, a good number of studies, and in our research uh, facility, where we investigate the efficacy of short chain fatty acids and medium chain fatty acids, the main difference to make it to, to bring it to the point is short chain fatty acids work strong more, much stronger on the gram negative bacteria and not that on the gram positive bacteria, while the medium chain fatty acids have a stronger effect on gram positive bacteria and lower effect on gram negative bacteria. So this is the main difference. In general, if you talk about the gut uh, itself, uh, of course, the role of the uh, short chain fatty acids is very uh, crucial in the gut because microbiota is producing short chain fatty acids uh, in the gut. And uh, there is a, a now recent publications in 2020 show that there is a clear communication uh, between the host, uh, the gut, the microbiota, uh, and the, uh, the brain of the animal. So this is keeping the animal healthy, the, the healthy microbiota with the short chain fatty acids. While medium chain fatty acids can help when there is a disease uh, presence or prevalence or prevention as a prevention tool uh, for gram-positive pathogenic bacteria. That's uh, the main difference. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, Natalia, I'm sorry that we didn't get to hear more from you, so we hope that we can have you back perhaps in a, a future edition of this Antibiotic Reduction Expert Series um, and hear more about uh, some of your research and insights uh, later on this year. Uh, Diego, uh, you've shared plenty of success stories, plenty of um, you know concrete results about where organic acids really have played a role in uh, controlling and preventing uh, some really serious challenges that could happen on swine operations. So I wanna thank you for that and, and bringing your insights uh, to our audience today. Um, thank you to everyone who attended uh, for having participated and everyone who uh, joins us on the recorded version of this as well that we posted online. Uh, we're, we appreciate your attendance. We hope this was helpful for you. Uh, please go ahead as we close our session now, as it comes to an end, go ahead and take uh, the two minutes uh, to answer the questions that will come up on screen once our webinar ends. We use that feedback in order to uh, modify this program to continue to identify topics that are important to you so we can carry on the discussion which we've been having uh, for the past 10 months in these webinar sessions. So thank you all for your continued participation and we hope to hear from you again soon. On behalf of Biomed, I want to thank you all for participating and have a great day. Thank you, Ryan, for the invitation. Thank you.